And can't nobody ever take that from me. What did it mean to cross the line and look up and see that you had won the world championship? It meant so much. It meant the people that supported me, the people that believed in me, my family. Just knowing that hard work pays off. It's been a lot I've been going through. But to overcome all of that and my work speaking for itself, being so silent this year because I wanted my performance to speak all the words that I needed to speak myself, it feels amazing. It feels like it feels like everything that paid off, and I'm grateful. Do you feel like you earned the respect of the Jamaicans and the rest of the world tonight? Um, not even just the Jamaicans. I feel like I've earned the respect for myself. Yeah. That's the biggest thing for me, not even just the world, but for Sha'Carri Richardson. I put that respect on me for me. I've been downplaying myself for so long, and this entire season, I know I belong. I know I deserve to be here, and it just feels amazing to execute that as well. And an amen goes right there. Feel free to shout. I mean, like, feel free to shout right now. Welcome to Brother from Another. Rita, what's up, Rita Hubbard? The NFL chick is here. What's up, Rita? Happy hump day. Happy hump day. And look, I'm, I'm so proud of Shakari. Uh, Shakari. She yeah. is just... She is just embodying what maturity looks like and what growth looks like. So it, I am why we're watching someone blossom before our own eyes. I mean, I mean, tell me about it. You know what? This is uh, brother from another. Uh, we don't always have like in the moment. You don't always know. Hey, what is this episode? What is the theme of this episode? I can say the theme of this episode on August 23rd, 2023. The theme of this episode is goats and grievances. <laughs> so we're going to talk about goats today and we're going to talk about grievances and sometimes goats who have grievances, which is really what you could. I mean, it's too early to put Shakari there now as the greatest of all time. We don't know that yet, but she still is very young. She's still in her early 20s, 23, 24 years old. 23, and she, yeah. as you as you just said, Rita, she did something. She did one of those things. There are many reasons I love sports. But one of the things, one of 500, one of the 500 reasons I love sports is that you have these opportunities, not just to win, but to win after you've gone through something, after you've gone through your lowest moment, after you've been through, you've walked through a valley, so to speak, and everybody has counted you out and you come back, not the same year, not the year after, but two years later, you come back two years later and you make a lot of people myself included, eat their words. Because let me tell you, I had some good belly laughs. I had some good full body laughs when she finished ninth, the Prefontaine. She finished ninth. She was talking a lot of stuff. She did not place. And that's where that first interview was from. If you are, if you're listening on uh, Sirius XM channel 85, you heard it. Watching on Peacock TV, you saw it. An interview where she said, I'm not done. Hey, hey you can go ahead and count me out. I'm not done. I thought she was delusional that day when I heard that when I heard that uh, quote and I saw that interview. I said, oh, no, she doesn't get it. She does get it. And she had a redemption. This is her redemption tour for for what she has gone through, not just finishing ninth two years ago, but being disqualified from the Olympics, smoking a little herb and admitting it. And there was a whole commentary over that. I'm just happy. Like yeah. she's there. She's dancing. She's running around. Good for her. Good for her, Rita. She did something Absolutely. that we all want to do. No matter what, no matter what field you're in, whether you're an athlete or not, everybody can relate to being at your lowest moment and then coming back to celebrate, pat yourself on the back, smile and say, see, I told you so. Yeah, I'm always a person that believes that the setback is always going to prepare you for your comeback. And everything that you mentioned regarding Shakari, it was, you know, was a setback. Her, like you said, not even qualifying a couple of years ago. Her and 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 you know, the going back and forth with the Jamaican runners, you know, all of that is part of the journey. She was young then, she was 21 years old, learning some stardom because, you know, we really did put her on a platform at a very early age. And, and none of us really knows what that's like unless you've been in that position add the fact of social media and it just really adds a whole lot of you know 
extra added BS to it. And so she had to learn the hard way, you know what I mean? But the good thing about it is she's young, she's able to learn from her mistakes, she's able to have people around her that says you need to focus on what you want to do and not focus on the outside noise and allow yourself to be your best self. And now we're having conversations about her one of her being the best runners in the world. So when you we talk about a comeback, I mean this is bigger than a comeback for her. And you know, I tried to always give her grace. Being young is hard, man. We yeah. think we know everything yeah. at 21 years old. I know I thought right. I knew everything at 21 years old. And life will learn you. And life learned that young lady, and now she's taking what she's learned. Those weren't losses, those were lessons, as far as I'm concerned. She's taking those lessons, she's learned what to do with herself in terms of how to be a better person, how to be a better runner, and she's running off with it, man. And I, I am just extremely, uh, proud to see her grow into what we thought that she could always be, which is a fantastic runner. It didn't destroy her. No. This, the, the whole process that she went through, it didn't destroy her. And she's been very open about some of the challenges that she's had in her young life. So when I mentioned the, the marijuana, and it's still on the banned substances list, even though it's not a performance right. enhancer, it's on the banned substances list. So. Maybe we need to have a family discussion about that. Does it need to about be it? on the banned substances list? I, I you know, it, it's not helping if, well, uh, who's it helping? <laughs> okay. If, if uh, anything, if, it's more of a hindrance, right? If anything, it's more of right. a hindrance than it help right. if you're running. You wouldn't, think, so. you wouldn't think a lot of runners would say, yeah, yeah, give me that. And so <laughs> if, if for opponents, it, are there opponents of Shakari Richardson who say, yeah, that's right, she should be banned because when she smokes marijuana, we're at a disadvantage. I don't think so. Anyway, okay, she was she was banned from the Olympics. She finished ninth. She talked about the death of her mother uh, last year on social media. I mean, she was she was an open book. I mean, she was taking live questions and going back and forth with people and telling folks where she stood and some of the lessons that she's learned at so to do that. To be exposed to that at 21 is something that you just mentioned. Uh, you wouldn't have been ready for it at 21. Rita, uh, I wouldn't have been ready for it at 21, nor 31, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I love the way that you, <laughs> it's something that she said, though, Holly, that I really, really loved in that uh, clip. And she was just like, he asked, you know, do you feel like you gained the respect of your peers, you know, your, the Jamaican runners? And she said, I feel like I gained the respect of me from me. That's what comes first. Everybody else comes next. Once you re make yourself respect yes. yourself and love yourself, yes. then the outward will happen. So, you know, she was going through what she was going through. And obviously, I mean, when in hindsight, it's possible to say she was reacting to everything that she was going through. And so now she has found some self-respect for herself, it appears, which, mm. you know, great self-love. And doing that means that you push yourself hard and work right. hard and do the things that you're supposed to do. So that part really, like, stood out to me, her saying that. Because, look, do you like to have the respect for your peers? Sure. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and act like people don't want the respect of their peers. But until you respect who you are and force yes. other people, respect you that's when everything comes into fruition so i'm really proud of her in that moment and in what i said okay so at 21 that's a little early to be going through yeah. like international like international scrutiny international analysis uh international trolling whatever international praise whatever it is all of those things can be destructive for you if you're not ready for it. So she took yeah. it at 21. At 23, she's able to say something like, I'm not back, I'm better. Oh, no. what? I'm <laughs> not back, I'm better. Come on, bars. come on gave now. Us some, she gave she, us hey, bars she on that one. <laughs> put it on a t-shirt, put it on a t-shirt, put it on a bumper sticker, I got you. Like, put my order in right now. Give me about three or four of those uh, in medium. Okay, three or four of those in medium, I'll take it. I'm not and back, that's, that's going to be the, the name of her autobiography. I'm not back, yes, I'm back. it should be. Because I'm, 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 I'm excited to see where she goes with this. Like, listen, we, we really, you know, we, meaning the public, you know, we built her up just to tear her down. And, you know, yeah. some people... 
typically can, you know, put their tail in between their legs and crawl out into the sunset and we don't hear from those people again. She said, nah, I'm too talented for that. I'm too good for that. And good for her for, for acknowledging that she's too good to allow the outside noise to dictate what she's supposed to do. And all she did was go back in the lab, fix some things here and there, make herself better. Mm. And now she's uh, potentially going to be a world, she's possibly going to be a world champion. I'm speaking that into existence. For yeah, the I like it. Now listen, <laughs> that glare, that glare, that spotlight, Rita, can either break you or yep. it can burnish you and you can become somebody better and somebody stronger as, as, as Shakari is talking about. Now, speaking of breaking, let me just transition. I'm, I'm, I've been praising Shakari. You've been praising Shakari. Let me transition to your boy. Okay, what's up with your boy? Uh, his name is John Harbaugh. And um, I, you know what? I, we just got to play. We just got to play what John Harbaugh said after the Baltimore Ravens. And I feel like a chump for saying this. Like, I'm mad, John Harbaugh. Yeah, I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you that I actually have to set this up by saying the Baltimore Ravens winning streak, their summer winning streak, their hot boy summer winning streak of, of 24 straight games has been snapped. It's fake. It's Fugazi. It's a fake winning streak. And you're <laughs> mad. And you're mad that I'm mad that you're talking about the winning streak. But anyway, here's John Harbaugh after that winning streak mercifully was snapped by the Washington Commanders. John, uh, of course, the first loss in, in preseason since 2015. Uh, what, is, what does it feel like to, to have the streak end? Yeah, it's just I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Think, think about something like that. I just told our guys, you know, you're proud of it, of course, you know, you appreciate it. But the thing that you're proud of is all those games are mostly just like that. You know, preseason games that people want to write, write about, some of you in here want to write about and say they don't mean anything because you never played the game. You never were out there in a preseason game. You never were fighting for a spot on the field. And yet you have the audacity to say that the effort that somebody puts into that to win and fight and win a game like that is meaningless. Tell me that was meaningless out there what you just saw. If you like football, is that a meaningless football game? You know, I can't respect anybody that says that because of the effort these guys put into it. That's, what's, that's what you're proud of. And that's, that's why I'm so proud of these guys for the way they fought. It doesn't matter win or loss. It matters, it matters the, way they, the way they went about their business tonight. And I'm proud of them for that. I always will be. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. It's just too much. It's too. It's just, it's just too much. It's too much to get to. He said the best thing he said was, "It doesn't matter win or loss." Cosign. That's my point, John. That's exactly it doesn't what he matter. Said. It doesn't That's matter. This whole time, it John. Doesn't <laughs> matter. Okay, ain't nobody talking about, oh, these guys aren't playing hard. These guys are bums. Nobody's talking about the players. Nobody's talking about the players. Everybody, hey, I want everybody to make the team. I'm sorry to have to be uh, uh, league-wide cuts. Somebody's dream is going to die pretty soon. They yeah. want to play in the NFL. They're going to be cut from the Ravens. They're going to be cut from the Commanders and the Patriots and the Steelers and the Chargers, and it's not going to happen for them ever again. They have to move on. Got it. I'm not rooting for that. What I'm saying is, right. this is summer football. And everybody in the league, except for John Harbaugh and the greedy owners who charge you, who charge you regular season prices for fake games, they're the only <laughs> ones who don't understand that it's not the same. The players know it's not the same. The fans know it's not the same. But John Harbaugh is mad because we're saying that streak uh, is dubious. Uh, you, know, it's just, uh, you, you, you know him better than I do. You, you, you cover this team, Rita. Help me out here. Help me out. I, it's, I can't. I, mean, I can't with know, him anymore. I can't. I can't with John. Look, John. John. You know the the hardballs in general. Jim. John. They are intense people, um, and so that is very genetic for them. And they get the, they get on their soapbox sometimes. And this is Harbaugh's soapbox moment where he felt like he had to tell us how dare you not say you know preseason games don't matter. Then turned around and and said, well, it's not about the wins and losses. So you do understand what we're saying because no one is saying in the context of. Pre 
preseason that it doesn't matter in the sense of players are trying to make roster spots, even if it's not with the team that they're currently playing for, they're trying to build up their resume if, if they get cut to move somewhere else. We're not saying that it's not important in terms of playing opposition to understand what your depth looks like. We're not saying it doesn't matter in terms of uh, off offensive or defensive coordinators or even special teams guys, you know, implementing things that they potentially could use during the season. We're not saying that preseason doesn't have a merit. We're not saying preseason is not important. We're simply saying that whatever the win and loss is does not matter in the grand scheme of things. And you understood that because you said that yourself. But no one said that preseason didn't have a place. We all <laughs> understand the place of preseason right. you just had to get cute and you had to get on your little soapbox and tell us that you don't respect people like me and holly us good citizens out here who recognize yeah. that having preseason wins and losses means nothing i remember holly the the year that the Colts won the super bowl and i think this was 2006 season uh they went zero and five they had a hall of fame game that year and they had right. the regular four season uh, four preseason games back in the day we know it was four preseason games went zero and five as peyton manning did that zero and five preseason matter and the wins and losses i promise you he doesn't care i promise you he does not care because the end result led to a lombardi trophy so harbs get off your soapbox sir okay you understand yeah. what we were trying to say there, there's so many there's so many preseason stories i've told the story before you know grew up in uh, uh northeast ohio so a lot of browns fans around there rita and uh one of one of my cousins uh, is, is a pastor. Okay. He's a pastor for church preseason 2017. I visited his church. He's wearing the pastor. Okay. He's wearing a Cleveland Browns t-shirt from the pulpit. And before he starts preaching, he says, Hey, I just want to say y'all the Browns are doing great this year. It was August. Okay. It was August. The Browns are doing great this year. I think they were undefeated in the preseason. He was really excited. Now you remember what happened in 2017 with the Browns. If you don't, you do. Come on, it's the Browns. Uh, Hugh Jackson was the coach. Okay, so Baker Mayfield yeah. hadn't gotten there yet. Exactly. But they got we Baker Mayfield the next year because they had a number one pick in the draft. So yep. we know what that undefeated preseason turned into for the 2017 Cleveland Browns. Really, it's not a big deal. And the other thing is. <clears throat> Like I would think that uh, debate coaches, debate team coaches, high school, college, middle school, they probably tell their students not to take the debate track and tact that John Harbaugh did by saying, well, you've never done, therefore you don't know. Now, okay, that, I mean, that's, that's kind of lame. That's kind of lame. Now, in some things, some things, if I sat here and I gave commentary on, I really shouldn't be talking about it. I say to a doctor. Oh, come on. Just cut him up. Just cut him up. Get that thing. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Come on. Get that going. <laughs> now, I don't know what I'm talking about. Sit down. Shut up and let a doctor be a doctor. If I try to tell the pilot how to fly the plane with no license, like Brandon Cooks, Brandon Cooks has a license. Brandon Cooks can tell him I can't. <laughs> but we're watching football, John. We're watching football. It's Americana. We all love it. And if I'm not mistaken, did John Harbaugh play in the NFL? Uh, not to my knowledge. No, his, we know his brother did, but we know, uh, okay. no. Yeah. So, yeah, listen. So he Harbs. said we never so we, played the game. We yeah. Never played and, the and, game. And, and he played in he college. Didn't either. So he played in college, okay. right? So, okay. 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 We're talking about the NFL. We talking about the NFL. Yeah, no, Some of those no, reporters there play high school football. We ain't talking about high right. school. Someone play college. So, right. Like that. Whether you played in the NFL or is not the point. But anyway, I got enough of the hard balls. I want to talk to somebody. I want to hear from somebody who's a who's a Hall of Famer and somebody who is who is sagacious and, and pleasant <laughs> company. Somebody yes. I always want to hang out with. Let's talk with Jim Trotter. He's a GOAT. He's a GOAT without a grievance. Absolutely. Let's talk to him next.
when you're talking about goats of the W, I need my name to be up there, mm-hmm. at least top three. Like that's my goal is like, I want something like when you're thinking of women's basketball, when you're thinking of the W, I want my name to be on Come it. Come on, tell them, so Asia, tell them. takes, like whatever it needs to get there, whether it's the rings, whether it's the accolades individually, like mm-hmm. I want to be up there in that category. Now, you on your way, being a champion already, only 26. Y'all got firepower now, MVP, two time. <laughs> two time. Two time. She got the defensive player of the year. She's a gold medalist. Yeah. She's got her own statue at 26. They do that when you like 50, yeah. 50, yeah. 50 you 60. Crazy. You don't feel none of the pressure though? No bull. Did you on like some LeBron shit with what you accomplished at such an early age? You're on pace to really break a ton of records. No pressure? It's just fun. Yeah. This is like my life. I love it. I love to hoop. Just putting the ball in the basket is really it. I told you. I told you at the beginning, Rita. I told you the theme of the show is goats and grievances. And so we got a couple of goats. We got a couple of goats here. One, we got the goat, Jim Trotter, and we had the goat, Asia Wilson, talking about her game last night. Jim, she put up 53 points against the Atlanta Dream. And I was watching this game and I could see it truly. True story. Now, I didn't think she'd score 50 something, but in the first quarter, I'm watching it. One, she comes down. It takes a difficult pass, catches a difficult pass, and just puts it up, floater, in. Made it, difficult play, made it look easy. I said, okay, she's in her bag tonight. Another time, Kelsey Plum came down. She's trying to get the ball to Asia, hits her with a left-handed bounce pass. Asia takes it, scores again. Another another play down, another uh, sequence down the court. She gets blocked at the rim, Asia does. No problem, runs back, uh, contests the shot on defense, comes back, scores again. I'm telling you, Jim Trotter, it was one of the best performances I have seen. This is a real talent. What did you see? Uh, what have you seen from Asia Wilson? Just not, not just last night, but all season. Yeah, let me say first, just watching that clip that you guys played, I kind of got goosebumps listening to her because the one thing I love is hearing a great athlete sort of speak it into existence and to accept the challenge of greatness. And to hear her say what she said, that she wants to be mentioned in those top three all time and whatnot, that was fascinating to me because I'm, I'm consumed with greatness in terms of watching it and trying to understand it of what motivates players or executives or whoever to do what they do and to do it at the highest level. So, you know, I actually got a chance to see her in person. Uh, I went to the Liberty Aces game for the Commissioner's Cup. And she didn't have one of her better games that that night. And obviously some of that has to do with Candace Parker being out and and the Liberty um, focusing their defense on her and making the other players beat them. But the thing that's great about her and where you see the greatness is great players will rarely ever have back-to-back bad games. And she came back the next night and put put, put up um, points and led her team to victory. And so the fact that she had 40 earlier this year, the fact she just put up 53, um, she's just a tremendous talent, and I think she's one of those people who is going to help, you know, the WNBA go to that next level. Now, I say this, to get to that next level, for me at least, there's got to be a rivalry between great teams. It can't just be solely about a great player here or there. It's got to be a rivalry there, and I go back to my youth and the Celtics and Lakers and watching Magic and Bird, that sort of thing, and I'm hoping that we have that with the Liberty and the Aces this year. So oh, we got right it. now, I believe, yeah. yeah, I believe they're both two and two this year against each other. Um, and they play once more, I think on the 28th of this month. So I am looking forward to seeing how that plays out and hopefully seeing them in the finals against each other. And Rita, yeah, uh, the Liberty, I was gonna say the Liberty have, have blown out the Aces. They, they, the Aces have beaten the Liberty, but the Liberty have put it on them. And yeah. so this is a, this is a really it's a really good uh, rivalry. I, I expect I hope that they meet in the WNBA finals. Uh, I'm sorry, Rita, you're going to say something else. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that the rivalry is already there, right? Like you said, they not only did the Liberty beat them, they beat them down, right? I mean, one was like almost by 40 points. And so, you know, they needed that that win after the Commissioner's Cup, I think, to, to just kind of help them get some some mobility going and, and, and feeling like the rivalry is real, right? That they don't have their number. And yeah. I think, you know, when, Car- when Candace Parker returns, that'll absolutely help them because as you already mentioned, Jim, they're, you know, they're saying we're going to stop her what are the rest of you going to do 
and if Candace Parker comes back, then that, that bodes a problem, right? You can't just do that and leave Candace Parker by herself. That That's problematic. But until then, I mean, it, it, look, it doesn't matter. I think that the, the Liberty was for the first time uh, became number one in rankings and the aces are number two. You can't tell me that they're not offended by that. The, the aces are mm. not right. Like they got to be like, oh, OK, so they think that they better than me just because they they beat us a couple times. We got something for them. And I think that Asia mm. having the game that she did last night is phenomenal. Going to the line 21 times. I don't know about y'all, but to me, that tells me y'all can't stop this lady. OK, and, right. and getting 20 points from the free throw. You can't stop her. If you're making her go to the line 21 times, that means that that she is a major problem. In addition to the 53 points, she played defensively extremely well. So not only are we having a conversation about her potentially winning another MVP, there's a conversation for her to be defensive player of the year as well. She's just having a phenomenal year. And she, again, after the loss that they just recently had, they really could have used the game that they had last night. So I'm excited yeah. to see hopefully a, a, a Aces and Liberty rematch in the finals. You know, one of the things I love about the WNBA and the Aces in particular is listening to Becky Hammond after a, a game. She's yeah. so honest and she's so direct. And so when she was asked about Asia last night, and, and, I, and I may get this a little wrong, but I think I'm right on the quote for the most part. She said she runs like a deer, she jumps like a cat, like a cat, and she catches like Spider-Man. She says yes. she's a superstar. I'm like... Man, go ahead, Becky, I hear you on that. So for me, um, this is what's fun because if the Liberty and the Aces can have that sort of respectful bad blood, to me, that's what helped take sports to another level or take a league to another level. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully come postseason, that's what we get. And, and I, I'm going to transition to football. I just want to let people know, like, you might be thinking, we got Jim Trotter on. Why are we talking about the WNBA with Jim Trotter? <laughs> Jim Trotter is a major WNBA fan. So uh, he is an observer and he's a smart person who can talk about anything. So that's why. And, and also, uh, and I want to explain the feed item there. Y'all know why Asia Wilson is named Asia, right? Tell him. So her, her, fa her father, her father is a fan of Steely Dan. You know the song Asia by Steely Dan? Asia. Mm -hmm. When all my dime dancing is through, I uh -oh. run to uh -oh. you. Uh -oh. oh, oh, uh -oh. wait a minute. Okay, <laughs> let, me, let me stop that. Let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. Like that. That, that's, all, that's all you can get for free. You have to, you have to pay for the rest, and I know you wouldn't want to. Uh, so, no, Jim, in all seriousness, let's talk about yeah. uh, a guy who's had a GOAT season but is not quite a GOAT yet because he's had some injury concerns at 24. And that's Jonathan Taylor, and he's got some grievances uh, with Jim Irsay. What do you think is going to happen with him? He said he wants to be traded. The Colts initially said they weren't going to trade him. Now they've granted his trade request. It's pretty close to the start of the regular season. He wants a new contract. We know how that goes with running backs. How do you how do you think the situation is going to play out? Yeah, for me, I don't. I think he has to be moved. I think it's just gotten to that point. You know, initially the owner came out and said he wasn't going to be traded. They were not in entertaining trade offers. And then for it to get to a point now where they've given him permission to seek a trade, I just think that the relationship has deteriorated to the point that it can't be mended. And I say that from the standpoint of the Colts have said, basically through their actions, they are not going to pay Jonathan Taylor. And so from that standpoint, I can't see this getting any better. You know, and I'm sure you guys have talked about this, Michael. The thing that's so fascinating to me is all we hear is that the position is being devalued. Running backs aren't being paid. And now you want to ship him out, but you say we need first round draft choice compensation, you know, uh, to let him go because he's that valuable. Well, which is it? You can't have it both ways here. Or maybe NFL teams think they can have it both ways. So from my standpoint, Jonathan Taylor is one of those unique talents in the NFL. He is deserving of, of what he is asking. And I think if a team were smart, I would not be so concerned about giving up uh, compensation that either is a first round pick or amounts to a first round pick. The question is, are you willing to pay him? And if I'm looking to win a title and that's a guy that I think can help me win that title, mm. 
Okay. I'm going to pay him. That's how I feel. He's there. Look there. You know this, Michael, there are levels to players and positions. Like you can have good running backs. I get that. But then there are some running backs who are more special than others. He is a special running back. And so from that point, I believe he should be paid accordingly. I'm with you on that. I mean, I, I agree with you. I'm, but, Jim, I, I, I'm looking at it like this. What we like to say is, is it Uchiwali or is it one Mike, right? Because you tell us that you don't want to trade him, but then you tell us that or that you're not going to pay him, but then you tell us that you want to be compensated with something equivalent to a first-round draft pick, which I feel like, and I could be wrong here, I feel like that this is gaslighting, uh, that, that mm. oh, we're going to let you go, but we're going to need a high draft pick, knowing that the other owners feel the way that they do about running backs. So I could be wrong here, but I feel like that he knows no one is going to give up a first-round draft pick for Jonathan Taylor, and now putting him in a position of, does he even want to play and just take the fines and not get paid to make his point of, of being on that team. But Jim Arce has, the way that he's handled this has been so poor. He's gone on Twitter and said these things and said it to the general public. He's uh, uh, shown his actions by this. And it, it, it it's extremely disheartening for running backs to be so devalued, but then you try to tell us that there is some value and that you need right. basically a robbery to come get Jonathan Taylor. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, you know, truthfully, I don't think teams are so concerned about the draft compensation. I think the issue is going to be the contract of what is Jonathan looking for. And at this point, we don't know. Um, he has not said publicly, at least to my knowledge, he has not said publicly what he is looking for. Um, the draft choice compensation to me is not the big deal because number one, it's not necessarily a first. They're saying compensation amounting to a first right. round pick. So so for me, that's easy, especially if you're a team and I'll just throw a name out there. If you're like a Philadelphia, Ooh. I kind of like Jonathan Taylor sitting in a Philadelphia backfield with wow. what they have. Do they have enough running backs at this point? I feel like they're collecting them like Pokemon pieces. They just traded for DeAndre <laughs> Swift not too long ago. They still what, got games. What, like, what are they doing here? What did I? <laughs> right, but what did I say, Rita? There are different levels. You are right. Yeah, that's right. He is a different right. level above those other guys that they have. And I'm just saying with everything else that they have, Man, especially playing in that conference where the road to the Super Bowl is much easier than it is in the AFC. Mm. Well, let me ask you this. How how he's been known to do a few things, too. And and I'm not in any way saying I have any inside information. I'm just saying based on history and track record, how he has a record of doing things. Well, we saw saw one of those headlines uh, and said, okay, here are the odds on the next team to get Jonathan Taylor and the Dolphins were on that list and the Bears were on the list and I think I'm intrigued by the Bears Jim and Rita you know tell me what you guys think about this I know the Bears are not a great team they had the first pick in the draft they trade back uh, they pick up a really good receiver in DJ Moore they pick up future draft considerations they're blessed with tons of cap space they recently just you know assigned somebody else because they got tons of cap space still if you're the Bears <laughs> And you're not trying to win a championship this year. I mean, I, obviously you are, but you're not going to. Why not get one of those different level guys? He's disgruntled. He's young. He wants money. You got money. He will be a, a great fit for your franchise. He can play for you for the next seven, eight years. If you're the Bears, wouldn't you do that, Jim? I would. Well, bro, first of all, no one is counting on a running back p- playing seven or eight more years from this point. You know that, right? I know. I mean, I know they, nobody, they I know nobody's, nobody's counting on it. But a lot of these guys, I'm here. Like, like I am here for the – I'm going to get a law degree so I can represent running backs, okay? <laughs> That's my goal. I am here for the running back. Don't do back. it. Don't do it. I'm Don't gonna do, do it, it, Michael. No, no let me tell my people. you. I had one – no, I had one agent tell me that the only running backs he pursues coming out of college are guys who are either projected to go in the top 10 or guys who are projected to go from the second round on. Because if you get him from 11 to 32, no, no, he's not. He's saying from 11 to 32, 
the teams have all the leverage and can lock right. up that player for up to eight years. So what is the incentive for him at that point to get one of those players knowing that they will never have the leverage? So first to 10 or two to seven, that's how he looked at it. And I can't blame him for that mm. because again, I go back to this, this CBA back in 2011 was so awful for the running back position and it's not going to be able to change until the next CBA rolls around. And I don't know that it will change then because the attitude that the union always takes is we have to look out for the greater good as opposed to one specific group, unless it's quarterbacks, right? So mm -hmm. from that standpoint, I don't see it changing for running backs um, mm -hmm. anytime soon. So the Bears, no, you're saying no on the Bears. No to the Bears. No, I don't think so. Look, when I talked to when I talked to um, Ryan Poles, their GM, earlier this offseason, he told me that their plan was by the third year, they would be competing for a championship. Now, he believes they're good enough this year to compete for the division. I don't know, as you said, Michael, I don't know if I totally agree with that. I think they Whoa. will be better. But the problem okay. is, again, one, what is, John, what is Jonathan Taylor's health? Can you count on the fact that he is completely healthy? That's still the unknown here. He's still not right physically. And so if you're saying you're going to give up compensation that amounts to a first round pick and you're going to give him the type of contract that he wants, you have to be really confident that number one, he's fully healthy or number two, as best as can be predicted, he is going to be healthy enough to help you for the foreseeable future. And maybe GMs don't know that yet and don't feel that yet unless they've had a chance to talk with him or look at his medicals. And I don't know that we've gotten to that point where anyone is asked to do that. I think that that's my biggest reason of, of being questionable about this whole trade, this potential trade is because of his health. We do know that he's right. dynamic, similar to Saquon, but we also know like Saquon, he's had some health you know, issues. So that's to me, I think why I felt like, you know, him saying, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll take something equivalent to a first round pick. Well, GMs are going to be like, well, is he even 100% healthy for us to right. give you that? And then we have to pay him. Right. Yeah. So uh, let, let's uh, let's talk about a couple more things before we let you go, Jim. We know you're a busy man. Uh, the hard no, I'm always here for news. you guys. You know that. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. The Harbaugh's are, are in the news to my great amusement. <laughs> already talked about one already talked about John uh, with Rita and uh, his defense of their 24 game winning streak that is now gone. Oh, put it on the head right. headline old school newspapers. It's Thank you, you know, America at war. It's above Thank the fold. Commanders. Ravens lose. <laughs> hey, was it on the front page of the Baltimore Sun? Do we do we break in a newscast to announce that? I don't know, but we have John Harbaugh on that one. And then Jim Harbaugh with his self-imposed ban because, you know, now he won't be able to coach against UNLV <laughs> no. and East Carolina <laughs> and Bowling, and Bowling Green. Green. Watch out. I know. Uh, I know. Talk to me about the Harbaugh's. I know you, I know you know both of these guys uh, fairly well. Yeah, you know what's interesting? I, I thought Rita hit it on the nail on the head where she talked about them having this certain gene you know, um, in terms of how they address certain things and how intense they can be and that sort of thing. I'll tell you a story from my time covering Jim Harbaugh back when he was a, a quarterback with the Chargers who was at the end of his career playing for a terrible team. So they're coming off the field one day after practice and I had on a 49er sweatshirt, right? And not thinking anything about it, right? It was a gift my mom had given me for Christmas some years ago. It was kind of cool out in San Diego, the weather I mean. And so I had on this sweatshirt, not thinking anything about it. So Jim's coming off the field and we got to do our, we got to do our press conference um, on the field. So I ask him a question. He looks at me in all seriousness and he says, I'm not talking to anyone wearing the enemy's jersey, enemy sweatshirt. And at first I thought he was kidding. I'm like, huh, okay now. And I asked my question, he goes, I'm not talking to anyone wearing the enemy jersey. <laughs> and then I looked at him and I said, well, well are you playing the 49ers this week? Cause they weren't. And he says, I'm not wearing it. I'm not talking to anyone wearing the enemy colors. <laughs> and I was like, you can't be serious. And so this went on for a minute. It went on for a minute and Jim was deadly serious. And he didn't answer any of my questions while I had on the 49ers sweatshirt, even though they weren't playing the 49ers that week, but it's just that gene that Rita was talking about that the Harbaugh's have in terms of their intensity and their competitiveness 
and maybe even, you know, how they relate to the media. I don't know. Now, the funny thing is people think, or, or some who were there think that Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh and I don't get along because of that, which couldn't be further from the truth. I think Jim respects when you come back at him and you don't just let him walk over you. So I, I consider Jim to be a professional friend, if you will, um, in terms of our relationship. But that's how they're wired, Michael. It's, they're just yeah. they're just different. And one thing I've learned over my career, not just with coaches, but with players, things that I might find silly or or just dumb, it really matters to them in terms of their motivation and how they go about their business. And I have I have had to learn to accept that and not project my feelings onto what it is for them. That's because there was a player once, and I won't say his name, you guys were mentioning Peyton, Rita was mentioning Peyton Manning earlier. And after this team beat Peyton Manning in the playoffs, I go and talk to this player and he says, um, he goes, man, they talked about them like they were just the greatest thing. It was like they spit in our face. And I looked at him like, I'm like, clearly you've never had anyone spit in your face because I'm never going to compare what prognosticators are saying about a game to someone right. actually spitting in my face. But what I had to learn and accept is that for that player, that's how that's he motivated like. himself, yeah. you know, yeah. and stop projecting what I'm feeling onto him. Uh, you know what? We just got uh, so, some breaking news. I want to ask you guys uh, quickly to weigh in on it. Uh, the depth chart is out in San Francisco. Brock Purdy, number one. Sam Darnold, number two. Trey Lance is the third quarterback. Uh, just your feelings on, on Trey Lance, who was once uh, the third overall pick. Now is the third overall pick goes to the third quarterback in San Francisco. Jim, what do you think? And Rita, what do you think? Well, for me, first off, I think Trey Lance needs to play. I mean, that's the bottom line. You can't fully evaluate him yet. He's thrown, I think, I was looking at the numbers today, since high school, he has thrown, I think, 420 passes, college and pros combined. And when you look at him this pre preseason, he has played a total of three quarters thus far, and it's been uneven. There have been moments, and there have been struggles. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm hinting at something I'm writing for tomorrow about how the NFL needs a developmental league so oh, that guys God. like Trey Lance, who was mentioned in my column, can get on the field and actually get some work so that you can truly evaluate what you have. Because we know the two positions that are toughest to evaluate in terms of the transition from college to the pros are quarterback and offensive line. So I'm not totally surprised by this. I think Sam Darnold has a greater track record in terms of what we have seen in the NFL versus what we have seen from Trey. And as I have watched Trey thus far in the preseason, what I have seen is someone who seems to be processing information more slowly than he should, going through his reads and whatnot. And that's not to any way question his football intellect or anything like that. It is a matter of saying he simply hasn't been through this. And he needs to, to go through some of these live bullets more and more to kind of get up to the speed of the game, if you will. That's where I fall on it. For me, you know, you, you mentioned like he hasn't played a lot and he's only drafted 20. This will be his third year upcoming, but then he missed majority of last year. So essentially he's a sophomore, right? And I think that we're overselling this because of how high he was drafted. And that's not necessarily fair to Trey Lance that someone said that they want to take a chance on him based on what they've seen from, you know, his abilities and what they think that they can nurture him into being. And so for him, he really just needs to get the reps. Sam Darnold has been in the league three years longer than him. So obviously he's had more time to be an NFL pro as opposed to Trey Lance still navigating what it's like to be in the league after playing what North Dakota State, which yes, is D1, but the level of talent is different than what Sam Darnold played at USC or even Brock Purdy at Iowa State, right? They're power five teams. So I, I, I think that there's an unfair shake here a little bit, and I'm with you, Jim. I do think when I watch him play, it feels like the game is still very fast to him, but that's also understandable because he has not played a lot of snaps Absolutely. in the NFL. Absolutely. So and what, where people are ready ahead, to throw Rita, him away... And I don't get it. I don't get throwing him away when he hasn't even played enough for us to evaluate him properly to say 
he's an NFL pro, just give him time, or no, this is not going to shake, and we need to move on. Yeah. And see, this is what well, bothers me a little bit, Michael, to be honest make it quick, with you here. Make it quick. Make it quick. Go ahead. What Go ahead. we're going to hear you now is it. Trey Lance is a bust. That's what yeah. we're going to hear from outside casual fans. Trey Lance is a bust. And I think that is so unfair at this point, considering it, he has not had an opportunity to I even like prove him. himself. Is it unfair, though? Is it unfair? Yes. Yeah, I do. I do yes. think it's unfair. Absolutely. He didn't play last Absolutely. year. He was hurt. Come on, Holly. He's, well, he's played he can, eight total what? games. Eight total games right. in the NFL in two years. Well, and we're going to say he's a bust. Uh, Come on. Uh, yeah, uh, Come on. Uh, Don't stop uh, 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 Stop it. And I like him. I like him. I like the kid. <laughs> but it's Leave a results business. Love you, Jim. Happy birthday, brother. All right, my people. Thank you, people. You know, Rita, I, I love this. Uh, just keep looking at this headline and the social media posts. Serena Williams welcomes her second daughter, Adira River, into the world. And... Yes. I, I just think it's such a blessing for a couple of reasons. One, one of the great GOAT again, okay? Uh, uh, the greatest uh, tennis player I've ever seen, Serena Williams, and, and deciding recently that, hey, I, she said, I don't like to use the word retirement. Let's say I've evolved, and I'm gonna choose motherhood over my career. She's done that. And so now she's got you know a beautiful family there. You see those two daughters. But the other thing, Rita, and, and you are the expert on this, I'm not. So I'm just saying, I, I know where, I know where my strengths are. I, di- I wasn't informed enough about the risk that women face, particularly black women facing with childbirth and how sometimes it is hard for professionals. They, they, they push professionals to listen to them more. They know their bodies and sometimes professionals haven't done it and it has led to some pretty disastrous results. And Serena has been very upfront about this and she has written uh, eloquent essays about it. I just think it's a blessing that she's in this position and that she will continue to talk about the risk of, of childbirth and knowing the signs and having professionals really be attentive to black women. I agree. Uh, you know, she talked in depth about her first pregnancy and how, you know, it 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 almost she almost lost her life um, in giving childbirth. And black women um, are they have the most fatalities when it comes to childbirth deaths. And it is something that is getting more press and more media. And I'm glad to see that. Um, but something still needs to change, right? You know, it's good to know. But now what? We have to do better and listen to to black women and women in general in terms of when they say something is wrong yes. you have to believe them and so for this holly serena is so courageous and, and she is doing something that i don't think that i would be able to do which is going through what she went through and then deciding that she's going to you know not let that you know, scare her off to continue her motherhood journey and to be a new mother to another child and to give natural birth to another child. And so, you know, for many, that would be enough for them to say, you know, I'm not doing this. Or if you're in the position of Serena and her husband who, you know, are financially stable, get a surrogate right. and, and have someone else carry the child for you. So for her to do this again, just is so courageous from her for her I know that people don't really see the courage in that, but to almost lose your life to something and then do it again, yes. to me, speaks courage. Yes, uh, and if they don't see the courage, I don't understand why they don't. Uh, extremely courageous, as you said. Congratulations, Absolutely. Serena. Baby number two, good stuff. So when I go to interview with New England, um, Robert Kraft hires me with the understanding that I'm going to bring the San Francisco philosophy. I'm jacked because, I, you know, I finally got there. And, and uh, the, the the quick story was we we did everything first class in San Francisco. Right. I mean, top drawer, treated the players great, looked after them, took care of them. Uh, it was a clear philosophy that I, I was bringing. I was excited to unveil. The first thing we get to, there's a uh, we're having a, a mini camp. <laughs> and so I'm just checking out, you know, how the setup of it, how it's organized. And I and so I'm I'm figuring into the the menu for the players on that weekend, yep. you know. And and Kraft comes to me and says, Well, you know, we're not gonna feed them like that, you know. We give them bologna sandwiches and chips and stuff like that. And I went and it hit me just as clear as a bell that 
I'm in deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I can't even feed them the way I want to feed them, oh, what's going to come? I mean, I knew it. I had a moment, you know, and, oh, my goodness. So, so he he didn't know what he was asking for, you know, at the time. Right. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't cover the bologna sandwich stuff <laughs> in the interviews. Yo, Rita, he went bologna sandwiches on you. He said bologna ah. sandwiches that Robert Kraft was trying to feed the players bologna sandwiches. They weren't even fried bologna sandwiches, which were great. Your thoughts on bologna? <laughs> They can't even get Italian cold guards? Come on. I mean, at least bologna is in that. We're not asking for surf and turf, but dang. Come on, man. <laughs> he wanted to take, Pete wanted to take Jeez. that shot, too. Good to see you, I'm Rita. Hey, thank you for watching Brother From Another. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, go ahead and do that now. Don't forget, you can catch us three to four weekdays on PeacockTV.com and on Sirius XM Channel 85.